Hi, I'm Walter Dellinger. I'm a professor at Duke University Law School on leave and a partner at the law firm of O'Melody and Myers. I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, which was not a banking capital the way it is now, but really a small southern town. Uh, my father died when I was 11. My mother went to work as uh, selling socks, ties, and underwear. Uh, uh, and my older sister helped support the family. Um, went off to my state university at Chapel Hill um, and did okay there, but did some picketing of movie theaters and um, some broken hearts on my part uh, and um, my broken heart. Uh, but I got my act together to hitchhike up to New Haven and talk my way into Yale Law School. So after Yale, um, I went to Mississippi, taught political and civil rights to the first integrated classes at Ole Miss, then clerked for Hugo Black, and then into law teaching at Duke. I'm not sure why I went to law school. I had thought very seriously about going to graduate school in history um, uh, or political science, but. I was not the sort that could have kept track of the note cards you need to write a dissertation. So I think I found my way to uh, law school. And I, and I thought Yale was the most sort of academic place. So I was sort of splitting the difference by going to law school there. My, the reason I got into Yale Law School, I think, is that people wrote them and said, look, he's got a very checkered uh, undergraduate record, but uh, he's going to be governor of North Carolina. So you ought to let him in. And, uh, Letting me in Yale Law School actually ruined my political ambitions because there I was, a Southern Catholic boy, and had gone to public schools. I got to Yale Law School, and I, I felt like I got in touch with my sort of inner Jewish intellectual, uh, and that after that, I'd always want to read some new book on the theory of law instead of going to rural Democratic Party barbecues and get started in politics. So Yale yeah, Law School kind of ruined me for, for politics in my case because I got so attracted to the intellectual side of the law that I could never spend the time. And I, 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 in some ways I regret that because I think doing the hard work of getting involved in politics and public life is actually admirable and it's, uh, it's an easier way out to be, to be an academic. Well, it's interesting. I wanted to do something for civil rights uh, after law school. Uh, and going to Ole Miss, which had just two years earlier been integrated for the first time with the first African-American student, I thought teaching political and civil rights to a predominantly white class at Ole Miss, though my, by my second year, we had more African-American students than any law school in the country, I think, except Howard. Uh, it was a very aggressive campaign by the dean until everybody got fired by the state legislature. Uh, but I thought that doing sort of missionary work um, among Southern white law students in a place like Mississippi was what I could contribute. I did a little bit of work helping out Marion White, now Edelman, who was with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, but not much. Mainly I was, I was teaching con law and civil rights. Well, I, when I'm asked what was my awareness of civil rights, it was omnipresent in my life. I mean, I, I didn't think much about the rightness or wrongness of segregation growing up until the Monday after my 13th birthday, when on that Monday, the Supreme Court decided Brown versus the Board of Education. And I'll re I remember our classroom teacher announcing to the class uh, that the decision had come down. The announcement was, and I remember the exact words, children, the Supreme Court has spoken. Next year you will go to school with colored children. Well, we did. Our teacher was wrong, of course. And I graduated from high school, you know, five, six years later without any African-American student having been in a classroom. In fact, I had been to college, law school, and was teaching political and civil rights by the time there was the final integration of the rural and small town South in, 19, in 1969. But from the moment the Supreme Court made its pronouncement in Brown, the issue of segregation and racial oppression 
was no longer a fact about the world. The court made it a normative question. I mean, and I think for many white Southerners, Brown made it an inescapable question that you had to confront. And you had to decide what you were going to do about it. And I know that there was a direct link between the court's pronouncement in Brown and my winding up on a you know, picket line in front of a segregated movie theater when I got to Chapel Hill for, for college. Uh, I went to American Legion Boys State and they had an oratorical contest and I spoke on prejudice and got booed. In fact, they had applause meters to pick the winner and the applause meter indicated I, that I had won because I got the loudest noise, but it was actually all boos. Uh, uh, that was when I was in the 11th grade, I guess. But so by that time, it was um, a commitment. I think I really, my older sister was um, sort of very much, it was now very much involved in Catholic left social work, was really my inspiration. I sort of got my values from her uh, growing up. Well, I wanted to go to Yale because the law school was very much engaged in, in sort of very much active sorts of stuff. Was able, it enabled me to put together my interest in the intellectual side of, of things and, and some social activism. Uh, but that's really what led me to, to Ole Miss after law school. And, um, I would have stayed three years except I got uh, the chance to clerk for Hugo Black. Uh, in 68, 69. You know, what is interesting to me is that in the South, growing up, in high school, in college, we all thought we wanted the South to be like the North. There was this mystique that the North was the promised land for African Americans, and that's what we wanted the South to be like. And it took a while to realize how much racial prejudice and discrimination there was in the North. And I think we're much more aware of that today. In some ways, the South has made an easier transition than a lot of the Northern, uh, northern cities where there's a sense of estrangement between the races. Well, I applied uh, to Hugo Black when I was a third year law student uh, and did not get it. Each justice had two law clerks at that time. And I applied right when I was still in law school and I applied a second time my second year uh, at Ole Miss. And I think black had a real attachment to the South and actually a real attachment to civil rights. Even um, a little bit of his categories hardened by the time he was 83, uh, as he was when I clerked for him. But I think basically the fact that I was teaching political and civil rights at a Southern uh, law school was something that, that made him think he wanted to set me on the right path. No, I wanted to uh, apply to Hugo Black for many reasons. I had to leave, I had to leave the classroom in the fifth and sixth grades, public school classroom in North Carolina when the Protestant Bible teacher came to teach the truths of the Protestant faith to our public school classroom. And the one Catholic in the class, me, and the one Jewish kid, my friend Victor Berg, we had to leave the room when the Protestant Bible teacher came in. So when I read Hugo Black's decision in the school prayer case, Engel against Vitale, I was in, uh, in college at the time. I was wowed with what this Southern Baptist thought about keeping government out of religion. Uh, and, and that really drew me uh, to him, that brand of uh, Southern liberalism that, that Black uh, represented. Uh, made me think that was the justice uh, for whom I wanted to clerk. I applied only to Justice Black. Yeah, I said, you're, you're, the, you're the person I want to clerk for and the only person I want to clerk for. So that uh, probably was a, a foolish strategy, but uh, I, it was a wonderful experience. Yes, I mean, it was, um, he was still a very powerful force at the age of, uh, at the age of 83. I mean, he would work, uh, the two law clerks, my colleague Steve Schulhofer, now a law professor, and I, he would have us out to his house after dinner, and he would work to, want to work till midnight. We'd be slumping over the table, and he would want to get out and work on another opinion. He was, he was really an elemental force of nature. Uh, I mean, it's very interesting. He was so critical as a leader of the New Deal he was really very radical in his economics, a real Southern populist, uh, and a real linchpin of the New Deal among the senators. Um, so it was, uh, it was quite an experience. 
Well, it, what was interesting is that Justice Black would usually have three opinions, a majority opinion and two dissents out of, every, out of each sitting of the court. And he would take the most important one himself to do the first draft. Uh, and the other clerk and I would do the first drafts of the less important assignments uh, that we had. Uh, and that he was full of passion about, uh, about the writing. I remember in uh, Tinker versus uh, Du Bois School District, kids that wore black armbands and were expelled from school when they were protesting the Vietnam War. I tried to persuade him that his First Amendment views should favor the students, his absolutism. But uh, by that time, he no longer saw it that way. And uh, when I tried to rewrite and soften his dissenting opinion, he was writing about lions and bash-ins and smash-ins, and he was, he was not comfortable with the emerging radicalisms of the late 60s. When I tried to tone down one of those opinions, he, he sent back a, uh, a copy from his vacation in Florida marked 3 a.m. on the, the draft <laughs> and put back in all of his most uh, heated rhetoric and said that he wanted me to send this to the printer without change. So um, looking back on some of my memos to Justice Black, I am struck by how I actually seemed to think as I was writing these memos that I was going to change the views of someone who'd been on the Supreme Court for 30 something years. Uh, uh, but I was unlikely to, uh, to influence his views in any large way at all, which I now realize in retrospect. So he made it quite clear that only one of us was nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. It was very touching. My mother, uh, it was um, the anniversary uh, of his like 30, 30th year on the court. Uh, and President Johnson had a dinner at the White House in his honor, and my wife said, your mother would love to do this. So she let me take my mother to the White House dinner, and she met Justice Black and was charmed by him, came by the, when she came by the chambers, and she noticed that there was no one there but one other law clerk and a secretary and the justice. So she said to me, she said, you know, he's very nice, but he's quite old. Uh, if anything happens to him, will you get promoted? <laughs> to be the justice. And I said, no, mom, it doesn't work that way. Uh, I would not be succeeding him. Uh, <laughs> I'm just the clerk here. Well, it was a very interesting court. I clerked the final year of the Warren Court. It was actually Earl Warren's overtime year. He had resigned a year earlier, but A. Portis's nomination had failed as chief justice. So Warren stayed on another year. And the day I left, Justice Berger started as chief justice. Uh, so that it was, uh, it was a very liberal and active court at that point. So it was a very different field than the court, uh, than the court today. Um, justices Stewart, White, and Harlan were the, quote, conservative, unquote, justices who would be, I think, probably left of center on the current court. Well, it was still true then, and I was surprised at the extent to which the court operated as nine separate law offices with one very senior partner and two very junior associates and a secretary. That was, a, and that the justices were not entirely comfortable approaching each other about changing their views. So it was often the case in every chambers that Justice Black would say, will you talk to Justice Stewart's law clerks and see if he might be persuaded to change this or that about the majority opinion? Uh, there was a lot of using the clerks as emissaries to other chambers to negotiate changes in opinions. Yeah, no, they're, 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 at least in those days, there was no preparation for being a Supreme Court law clerk. You walked in the door and the outgoing clerks just left you with a pile of work. Uh, we were only two law clerks per justice, and uh, instead of four that the court now have. And the court decided 168 opinions, the term I clerked, instead of something closer to 68 or 70. So we did far more cases and, you know, in some ways far more slapdash. But the opinions were a lot shorter because nobody had time to write these lengthy law review articles that the court produces these days as opinions. I think he had become, I think there's a certain rigidity that sets in uh, at least to some people as they get older, there was a, 
bit more rigidity about Black at 83 than I think there had been at earlier points in his career, but sometimes that rigidity was very beneficial. His, um, a year or so after I finished clerking for him, he got to write his great opinion in the Pentagon Papers case, uh, which is, he got to uh, almost his valedictory as a pay-on to the First Amendment and its role in keeping us out of foreign wars with foreign fevers and foreign shot and shell. It had almost a World War I flavor to it. But uh, Justice Black was opposed to <clears throat> every war the U.S. ever fought except for World War II. He, uh, he was um, vehemently opposed to the Vietnam War, uh, for example. Uh, early on, it was 68, 69, before much of the country had turned against the war. He thought World War I had been a mistake. Um, uh, and so he felt a particular passion about the Pentagon Papers and what they revealed uh, about how the country was being misled.